We're now beginning topic number nine, the Quran and the Bible. And for the reading assignments, uh, you will read Journeys, uh, chapter six, and the dialogue, chapters five and um, 17. Chapter five and 17 in the dialogue and chapter six in the other book. When we lived in Somalia, one night, a student came to my office. His name was Ibrahim, as I recall. And he said, please give me a Bible. And so um, it was, as, we, as you know, against the law to propagate Christianity. So he signed a statement saying, I have voluntarily asked for this. My teacher has not tried to force me to take it. <laughs> and uh, with great joy, he received the Bible and tucked it in his shirt so no one would see it and uh, went out into the night so happy he had received a Bible. The next night, he returns and uh, he still has this Bible in his shirt, or wrapped up in a piece of paper. And he lays it on my desk, and he says, it is not scripture. Last night, he said, I read the first part of the Bible, Genesis. It's a history book. It's not scripture. It is corrupted. Without even opening the door for any conversation, he just left the Bible on my desk, and he walked out into the night. He said, I'm very, very disappointed. I thought the Bible was scripture, and it is not, and left the Bible on my desk. Now, question is, how would you respond? You see, within the Muslim understanding, revelation comes down. It is tan zil, sent down revelation, from an original revelation in the heavens. And so it transcends history. It's suspended above history. Muslims have their history. It's the Hadith. We talked about that earlier, the traditions. That's their history. But that is not the Quran. And so reading the Bible, he says, it's corrupted because it is historical narrative. And it's true. About 70% of the Bible is historical narrative, you see. So it doesn't compute how that can be scripture. Okay, let's get in our groups again of two, just very quickly. Uh, how would you respond to Ibrahim? He puts the Bible on my desk and he says, this cannot be scripture, it's a history book. And it goes out into the night. Suppose you had an opportunity to meet him at a tea shop, and I went to the tea shop sometimes there, in the town where I lived, and we would have conversation with the students. Suppose some night I'm at the tea shop, and he appears and sits down by, my, by, by me at the tea shop. How would you respond to this question, this charge that the Bible is corrupted because it's a history book? How will you respond to Ibrahim? Got it? Okay. Just discuss that in your small groups and then feedback. Okay, are we ready to respond? I know that you need more time for this, don't you? But we'll start with the women back there, to, 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 my, to my left. If you're ready. How would you respond, please? Um, uh, well, there, is, uh, there is a real fact. There is? Uh, there is a real fact. Okay. And I don't know why. That there's real facts in the Bible. Okay, okay, the history is really, truly accurate history. All right, that's a good, that's a good response, yeah. The, tr the history is a reliable history. Mm -hmm. The Bible is the only accurate ancient <coughs> history ever written. And of all the ancient, the Bible, of all the ancient histories, the Bible is the most reliable ancient history, is what um, Albright used to say, one of the leading archaeologists of the 20th century. What about this side here? Yeah. Uh, yes, I agree. There are many historical events described there, but 
God's presence is felt and seen in all of them. Okay, excellent. Very good response. Yes. What about these theologians here? Um, I would start with what you uh, told us a couple days ago or yesterday, that uh, Quran says that there are scriptures uh, with uh, Christians and uh, uh, Israelites and they need to ask questions so you did good thing that you come to me and ask questions I gave you the scripture of course uh, the Islam teaching now that uh, all the scripture is corrupted well uh, we don't have the, the, the original version if as you would say you Islam believe that there is no original version but we believe that there is original version and uh, Anyway, uh, it's better to read, I would like to read a lot of books, and it's better to read Torah and Zabur. Zabur is not the theology, it's a, it's a psalm book, and the Muslims like the psalm books, so it's okay. And it's good to read Injil, as uh, we have it available. And then you might want to use your Quran to check, to compare it, uh, and see what's uh, right, what's true for you. and come back and we'll talk about this. Okay, okay, yeah. But the problem is, of course, he did that. He read the book of Genesis. He's very eager. He's reading the Torah. Wow, I'm reading the Torah. He was extremely disappointed, you see, because, as I said, for Muslims, Hadith is the history. The Quran is instruction, you see. And the two are different, are different books. So he saw that we're mixing together Hadith and Scripture. It's all mixed together. That was his great problem. Yeah. G good response. Helpful. What, what about this? Yes. I'll say the, the two arguments. The yes. first argument, if narrative never can be Scripture, then anything narr any narrative in the Quran should not be Scripture. I mean, if... if Anything saying a narrative or historical, it's not scripture. Even a small portion in the Quran, if it looks like a narrative, it should not be accepted as scripture. This is, a, I mean, first argument. The second argument, if Quran said that Torah, Zabur, and everything is the God's words, then he argued not with his idea, he argued with Quran. So you have okay. to accept what the yeah. Quran accepted. Yeah. And then yeah. if Muhammad said this is God's word, yeah. he has to accept that. Yeah. Whatever it's narrative, not narrative, yeah. You go against the Muhammad and, and yeah. Allah with starting saying it's not something wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, what he would say is apparently a big problem developed because this can't be scripture. You know, so apparently somewhere along the line, the Christians and the Jews mixed it all up and they and they put together hadith with scripture. That that, that was that was his feeling, you see, because if revelation has been sent down from above, then it cannot be history. The Quranic understanding of revelation is that it is suspended above history. Now in the court on your right, there are allusions to history as parables, as parables. But the historical narrative as such is not the stuff of revelation within the Quran. It alludes to some historical events as illustrations, as parables, and so forth. But the historical narrative is really within the Hadith. Within the Hadith, yeah, yeah. So that's a major challenge. Um, and it's one of the reasons that Muslims suspect that the Bible is corrupted. Not only suspect, many of them are sure it's corrupted, like was true of this Ibrahim. Because within the Quran, you have this understanding that the Quran came down from a mother of the book in the heavens, and this is called Tanzil. We talked about this the other day. This is a sent down revelation which is suspended above history. Then alongside the Quran, you have the Hadith, which we talked about this morning, which are the traditions. That's the history, you see. And, but the two are two different books. The Hadith describes the way Muhammad did things. That's the historical stuff. And then the Quran is God's instruction on what we should believe and what we should do with some illustrations from historical events as parables. But then you get Genesis. In fact, Ibrahim said last night, and some of the history is not edifying. He said last night, for example, I read the account of Lot 
getting drunk and having incest with his daughters, you call that scripture? It's corrupted history. And he was, he was very disappointed. And he left it on my desk, you know. Yes? Uh, can you say that uh, uh, God's re revelation cannot be abstract? So it cannot be uh, given, so it's given to a particular person. So it cannot exist without the context in which it's given. So, and that's why in the Bible it's presented in the real context because it was given to a particular man. So like a uh, Quran was given to Muhammad. So uh, it's better to set in the context where it's given and it cannot exist without uh, an ab abstract world without the real context where it's given. That's a wonderful Christian response to the question. It's not the Muslim response. <laughs> because the Quran transcends context. The Quran, for example, is organized according to the longest chapter coming first and the shortest chapter coming last. It is not organized chronologically. If you organize it chronologically, it would seem then that perhaps the context helps to inform the content of the scripture. And that's not Islamic at all. This understanding is that it transcends context. It's suspended above context, you see. So even the way the Quran is organized is to communicate that reality. If the Quran were, con were a contextual revelation, as Muslims see it, then you would organize it chronologically. But it's not organized chronologically. It transcends context. Yeah. So what we're doing here is looking at the Quran through Christian eyes. But a Muslim would say it transcends context. Uh, when I was uh, having this dialogue in the United Kingdom, at the Central London Mosque several years ago. We got into this quite deeply that evening. In fact, that evening, the dialogue was to be on Revelation. And so we, we were getting into this very, very deeply. And so finally, what I did was to hide behind the podium there at the Central London Mosque with 400 people looking at me. I hid behind the podium like this. And I said, help me, my friend, the, the dialogue companion, is this your understanding of Revelation? God himself does not meet us, but because he's merciful, he sends his revelation down, tanzil, to us, instructing us on what we should believe and what we should do. But it is suspended above context. It comes down from above. Is that your understanding? And he said, actually not. It is Gabriel who brings the revelation down. God does not bring it down. Okay? So let's act that out. Could you be Gabriel? All right. Yeah, you be Gabriel. And could you be Moses? Okay, so you just kneel there, ready to receive the revelation. And you kneel down, ready to receive the revelation. Okay, so God never meets us. He never comes down and meets us in Islam. But because he's merciful, he gives the revelation to Gabriel. All right. So, Gabriel, you take it and give it to Moses. Have you received it, Moses? Yes. Gabriel, did he receive the revelation? Was he happy to receive it? Yes. Good. Okay. All right. So, you, sent the revel you brought the revelation down. Okay. See, that's Tanzil. God brought it down to Moses. Thank you, Gabriel. You may go back and take your seat now. We'll need you later on sometime. That's Islamic understanding of revelation. But I said in the mosque that night, this is not the biblical understanding. In the Bible, God comes down and meets us, you see. That's the heart of biblical revelation. The heart of biblical revelation is that God is known by what he does in history. And so the very heart, the soul of biblical revelation is the acts of God in history, you see. And God coming down and meeting us within our history. And what's he doing in history? He is calling forth a people, a covenant people, to be his witnesses in the whole world, you see. And so biblical revelation is the account of God's acts in history as he comes down to redeem us. And it is the story of his people, both being faithful to him and sometimes in rebellion against him. All of that is the stuff of revelation. 
And the work of the prophets is through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, to bear witness about these acts of God in history and interpret what it means. And the stuff of Revelation includes our yes to his revelation and our no to his revelation, you see. That's the heart of biblical faith. Therefore, the Bible has to be a history book because God acts in history. He doesn't just send his will down. He himself comes and meets us in our history, in the yuck. When Adam and Eve turn away from God, within Islam, God sends Islam down to them. In the Bible, God goes into the garden and meets them hiding behind the bush. See, right there at the very dawn of history, we see the difference in the understandings of Revelation. And right there, God promises a son born to the woman will come someday. So supremely, God has acted in history in Jesus the Messiah. He is the supreme act of revelation, you see. <laughs> so I just love this question when Muslims bring it to me. Oh, the Bible is corrupted because it's a history book. I say, I'm delighted that you've noticed that the Bible is a history book. This reveals exactly the essence of the question that confronts us as we and Muslims interact with each other in regards to the nature of revelation, you see. Yes. When the Muslim pray to Allah, right, mm -hmm. not to the Gabriel, mm -hmm. maybe some of them pray to Muhammad, the intercessor. They, they shouldn't, although they do often view Muhammad as an intercessor. Yeah, but they yes. pray to Allah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they kind of expect that Allah answer, yes. give them answer, maybe not verbally, but at least in the life. God act in their life, yes. Allah act. Yes. So they should have some the idea of notion that it's God who's acting with you not through the mediators if he answers your prayer. So they have to have some kind of a understanding of what you say in the Christian yes. world. Yes, yes. Do they? I mean, oh, certainly, certainly, they do. And yet, it, 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 they certainly do. And a broad stream of Islamic uh, practice also does call upon intercessors, you see. Like I said earlier today, Muhammad becomes an intercessor for many Muslims. Now, the Wahhabists of Arabia say that's, that's false Islam. You shouldn't do that. But uh, people feel a need for an intercessor. And they notice this verse in the Quran, no intercessor unless God appoints him. They say, I believe Muhammad's been appointed by God to be an intercessor. So you do have this intercessory dimension. And when we, when we talk about Sufism, we'll talk more about that. Um, but yeah, Muslims, like I said yesterday, after the Salat prayers, they always sit in the mosque with their hands outstretched like this, looking up to the heavens and conversing, bringing their petitions to God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they believe that he hears them. Yes, yes. I, now I try to imagine what's the difference between Christian prayer, true prayer, true Christian prayer, and uh, Muslim prayer. A true Christian prayer should be the, the conversation between uh, pe person and God, a direct conversation as a talk. And probably Muslim prayer is just sending the messages, hoping probably he will hear, probably he will be so merciful and sometimes answer my uh, messages to them. Is it right? I, I, I feel that says it very well. I think it says it very well. Yes. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community and with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS resource base, please visit tvseminary.com. Let's continue our discussion now of the Quran. Um, Muslims believe that the first revelation uh, came to Muhammad at Mount Hira. This was in the year 610. And this first revelation began in the month of Ramadan. This is why Muslims fast through the whole month of Ramadan. Um, because it's a commemoration of revelation. And revelation means two things. It means discipline. So you fast in Ramadan, remembering the disciplines that we need to uh, practice. And it also means celebration. So at night you feast. Feasting at night, fasting in the daytime, both sides are, revel are examples of what revelation is about. And this is the first word of revelation found in Surah 96 of the Quran. Read or proclaim in the name, I'm sorry, it begins, in the name of Allah, most merciful, uh, most gracious, most merciful. Read, 
or proclaim in the name of your Lord and cherisher who created, created man out of a mere clot of congealed blood, proclaim and your Lord is most bountiful, he who taught the use of the pen. First words of Revelation. And he claimed that a white being appeared to him and is proclaimed this statement to him. He went and told his wife what had happened. He thought he must be going crazy. And she says, no, you must be a prophet of God. And this must be Gabriel that came and appeared to you. And then subsequently out there in that cave, Mount Hira, outside of Mecca, occasionally this being would appear to him and additional words of revelation came. And these revelations continued for 22 years. Not all at once. So when we say Gabriel brought the Koran down, I do not mean for a moment that Gabriel brought the whole Koran down at one time. The thought is that bit by bit, Gabriel would bring this portions of the Koran down and teach Muhammad. And what is Gabriel bringing down? He is bringing down portions from this mother of the book in heaven. You see, that's what he's bringing down. Um, this um, this um, portions of this mother of the book in heaven, um, bit by bit, called the Um Ol Kitab. Um Ol Kitab. And uh, we read about that in, um, in um, Surah 1339 in the Quran. Now Muslims believe that this first night of revelation is the night of power. And right in the midst of the month of Ramadan, they have their feasting when they celebrate the first time that revelation came down to Muhammad, the night of power. Uh, and this is described again in the Quran, chapter 97, uh, 1 to 3. The night of power. The Quran says that if the Quran had come down to earth and would hit a mountain, if the whole Quran at one time had come to earth and would have hit a mountain, it is so powerful, it would smash the mountain to pieces, you see. We were talking yesterday about the power of the Quran and how Muslims memorize the Quran to incarnate this power, you see. Um, it's this idea that this word of revelation is not only instruction, but it is also a powerful revelation. This Quran is Ijaz, which means a miracle, which cannot be duplicated. Muhammad could not perform miracles of healing and so forth like Jesus could. So people would come to him and they would say, Muhammad, I mean, Jesus did miracles of healing and casting out demons and whatnot, and why don't you do miracles? Muhammad's response was that the Quran itself is the miracle. That the Arabic in the Quran could not be duplicated. And uh, Muhammad would recite some of the Quran, and then others would try to recite similar kind of poetry, and they couldn't do it. So the miracle of Muhammad is the miracle of the Quran, with a kind of Arabic poetry which uh, could not be duplicated. It's Ijaz. It is a miracle that cannot be duplicated. Now, some portions of the Quran are allegorical, and others are clear and foundational. And so, although all of the Quran comes from the Um ul Kitab, this mother of the book in the heavens, there is within the Um ul Kitab a kernel of instruction, which is at the very soul of the Quran, which um, occupies the centerpiece within the Quran, and then the allegorical material are like around that center, you know, that, that heart of the Quran. And, and you see, that is where it's so important we as Christians be very careful in our interpretation of the Quran. Because Muslim scholars are the men of, of, of wisdom who have studied this book thoroughly and they understand what this core of instruction is within the Quran, which sets the tone for the way you interpret the entire, interpret the entire Quran, you see. I'm appalled at the way some Christians attempt to interpret the Quran. There's an acquaintance of mine, for example, who sat with five, I think, five computer banks 
with different English translations of the Quran and wrote his book on what the Quran says. Well, he has no idea how Muslims go about interpreting the Quran, you see. No idea whatsoever. It's a horrible way to interpret the Quran with computers in the English language and so forth, not even knowing Arabic, you know. That the Muslim scholars go into the soul of this book, particularly the heart of it, which has to do with instruction and teachings, you see. And they get that soul of the Quran, and then the rest of the material, the allegorical material and so forth, um, are interpreted in light of that central reality within the Quran. And this takes scholarship. It takes scholarship to do that. And so, as a Christian, we can say to our Muslim friends, as I read the Quran, this is what I see. Please help me understand. And let him do the interpreting as to what it really means. <clears throat> now, as we mentioned the other day, Muslims believe that there are several books of Revelation. We talked about this the other day, so I won't spend much time on this now. The Suhuf, which was sent down through Abraham. The Taurat, sent down through the prophet Moses. The Zabur, sent down through the prophet David. And the Injil through Jesus the Messiah. And then finally comes the Quran, which uh, in many ways supersedes the previous revelations by um, clarifying them, you see. In a way, Muslims work with the other revelations, like the Taurat, for example, the way we do as Christians. We look at the Torah or the Zabur in the light of Jesus, you see. We call this a Christ-centered biblical hermeneutic, looking at the scriptures in the light of Jesus. So Muslims, when they take the Torah seriously, sadly many of them never read it, but when they do, they or, or read the Injil, they will assess the Injil and interpret it in the light of the final word, word of Revelation, which is the final clarification, meaning the Quran. So they interpret the former scriptures through a Quranic-centric view of Revelation, just as we interpret the Bible, just as. Remember, we interpret the Bible from a Christ-centered hermeneutic as well. So we have Christ at the center. Our Muslim friends look at the former revelations in the light of the Quran. But sadly, too many of them never do read these former revelations. It would be a tragic thing if Christians uh, would say, we understand Jesus, but they never read the Old Testament. <laughs> you know, you've got to read the Old Testament to understand Jesus. Uh, you just got to. But we interpret the Old Testament then in the light of Jesus. It's through the Old Testament that we learn to know who Jesus is, but we then interpret the Old Testament in terms in the light of Jesus. And so Christians are called the people of the book. And they possess these former scriptures, the Torah, the Zubur, and the Injil. And Muslims believe that they, that, uh, um, they possess, uh, and Muslims believe that they possess this Quran, which is the final scriptures. Interestingly, the Quran commands Muhammad, if you are in doubt to what we've revealed to you, ask those who've been reading the book before you. And the Quran commands the people of the book, the Christians, to expound their scriptures to mankind and not to hide their scriptures. Ah, I like that reference too. I often remind Muslims of this command that the Quran gives to us Christians to expound our scriptures and make them freely known. And another com command in, this, in the Quran is to stand upon our scriptures. 568. Stand upon your scriptures. And I share with Muslims many times that I'm a person of the book. I read this book daily. It forms me. It has formed me for a lifetime. I stand upon these scriptures, you know. I bear witness from these scriptures. I'm a person of the book. And I find that that confession um, helps to give credibility <coughs> for my witness among Muslims. Be people of the book and people who are disciples of Jesus the Messiah. That tends to open doors in our conversation with Muslims where they have a high respect for the people of the book. Okay, we will conclude this session. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed 
and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota. 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.